the enemy tanks have stopped. Why? Why waste precious tanks when they can pick us off from the air like fish in a barrel? There are 400,000 men on this beach. Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show and today we are finally going to be reviewing that Leica watch that I unboxed a little while ago. Now before I get into this video I have to do a wristwatch check and if this thing will focus. I'm wearing my Casio F91W uh, on a, I'm not sure if that's a British military uh, NATO strap but uh, yeah camouflage NATO strap and <laughs> you couldn't get a more polar opposite watch. Uh, not only in size and scale, but uh, also it's digital, obviously, uh, to the watch we're reviewing today. We're not only going to be reviewing this incredible Flieger uh, from the German manufacturer, we're also going to be discussing the watch from Dunkirk. If you're not familiar with the latest Christopher Nolan film, and I've got to say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan, it was released a couple of weeks ago, and if you remember in my Breitling Navi Timer versus the Zinn 903, I think it is, the Jewel. I had just seen it the previous night, a couple of weeks ago now, and uh, I needed some time for, for the movie to kind of settle, but I was really, really impressed with it. I loved the way that an Amiga watch was featured, worn by Tom Hardy's character, who was a Spitfire pilot, having these incredible dogfights with Messerschmitts in the skies over Dunkirk. But most importantly, and I can say this now because I, I have since gone and uh, rewatched it, I really do think, uh, in my opinion, it is Christopher Nolan's best work so far. But also as a horology fan and as a watch fan, its use of time is ingenious and it's, it's a reoccurring theme. I mean, he's a, he's a filmmaker that uses time a hell of a lot. You guys know my admiration for the Interstellar movie with the Hamilton watches and um, time is also uh, used in Inception and of course his early film uh, Memento which is um, all about memory and, and told in a kind of a bit like jigsaw pieces talking of World War II it reminded me actually of Catch-22 the way the, um, the chapters are all uh, messed up um, out of chronological order so very very different genre but anyway wonderful wonderful filmmaking it really had a quite a profound emotional effect I, I had to fight back the tears especially with uh, Hans Zimmer's use of Elgar's Nimrod at the end the same kind of moments seen again from different perspectives reminded me a little bit of a slightly Kurosawan Rashmoon uh, way of, of storytelling with incredible moments from different characters perspectives it was utterly fascinating the the use of tension building and also there was even watches or clock ticking used in the score very ingenious and i kept looking at my watch and i was thinking my god is, is that my watch ticking but it was um very very well done incredibly enjoyable and an overlooked but important part of um world history so it was it was fantastic. Now, the watch you see here before you was worn by, well, this is a modern descendant of the watches, the famous Flieger watches worn by the German Luftwaffe. And in Dunkirk, we see the stunning Amiga worn uh, by the RAF pilots. Now, the Amiga featured in the film was the CK2129. And there were 2,000 of these made for the Ministry of Defense at the start of the war. Uh, the watch is made particularly easy to read for pilots, uh, thanks to its lovely cream dial and its contrasting large black Arabic numerals and very bold hands. The CK2129 was the most commonly worn Omega watch for the RAF personnel, especially in the early days of World War II, which is when Dunkirk happened, because of course this was 
pre-Battle of Britain. We'll discuss Battle of Britain in a little while because there's a fantastic shot in the 1969 film of some Flieger watches, but we'll, we'll get on to that. So the watch also features a rotating bezel that enabled uh, the timing of specific intervals and was very helpful for planning bombing raids and other attacks. The bezel actually locks uh, with the use of a second crown at the four o'clock position, very similar to the Glycine Airman actually, come to think of it. And this also stops it from being accidentally moved if you're timing something specifically, especially in a combat situation, uh, prevents it from being knocked out of place. Rather contemporary considering during its, uh, its time period. In the movie, Tom Hardy's character is, is flying this beautiful Spitfire. And, you know, I've got to say, I was just, <laughs> I was just in love with, with these scenes. It, I felt like a little kid again, although slightly terrifying uh, because it does, it, the film captures beautifully the high tension of these moments. During one of these dogfights, a Messerschmitt actually shoots at uh, Tom Hardy's uh, Spitfire and one of the bullets penetrates the cockpit and takes out his uh, fuel gauge. Thus, he uses the timing feature, the timing bezel on the Amiga to figure out how much fuel he has left and therefore how much time he has left in the sky in order to defend the, the, the brave soldiers stuck on that beach in Dunkirk. So the watch actually is a plot device and we get lots of lovely juicy wrist shots in the cockpit. So just fantastic. You could not, as a watch enthusiast, you could not ask for more. So I did a bit of digging about and I was aware that, um, from previous watch reviews that Amiga supplied a lot of watches for the British Armed Forces and actually the, the Allies in general. But I was not aware that they were the largest supply of watches during both world wars. In fact, in World War I, Amiga's ability to offer precision watches in large quantities made it the watch of choice for the British Ministry of Defense. With the warfare in the trenches, Amiga were among the first ever made that became essential tools for commanding officers. Being able to time exact differences between a flash and the sound of opposing gunfire, thus enabling uh, officers to calculate the distance between the themselves and the enemy. Very, very necessary and um, important information when planning an attack. So by World War II, Amiga delivered more than 110,000 pilot and soldiers watches to Great Britain's Ministry of Defense to support its Air Force and Navy pilots. This translated to almost 50% of all Switzerland's uh, watch deliveries to the United Kingdom during the war. Now, if you've seen earlier reviews, we featured um, military military watches from JLC. Longines had a long heritage of making military watches for the British forces as well, but Amiga was the, the biggest supplier. Amiga had such a, a big contribution to the Allied victory that after the war, Field Marshal Montgomery, the command of the Allied forces on D-Day, made both an official and a private visit to the factory in Biel uh, to thank Amiga. We've got to remember this is an age before computers, well, Alan Turing was, was inventing the, the first computers in order to, to crack the uh, Enigma code, but computers were not used in the field. Watches or timing instruments rarely were the cutting edge of, of technology, and most of this intelligence and experience gathered by Amiga really did lay the foundations for the what we all know as the Seamaster line today. All of that experience and, and knowledge went into the watches of the post-war period. Amiga, among with the, uh, the CK2129 worn in the movie Dunkirk, later released the CK2292, and the most famous and widely used of all. This watch was powered by a 30 caliber that had set numerous world precision records at observatory trials. Thanks to a new alloy used to make the balance spring, it was highly anti-magnetic and thus perfect uh, to be used in the cockpit of a plane with all that electronic equipment. This was a great help to Spitfire and Hurricane fighter pilots in particular. Now later in the war, Amiga then unveiled the CK2444. This watch was very important indeed because of its extreme water resistance. In fact, the Ministry of Defense was so impressed that they actually had uh, WWW engraved on the case back. This is of course standing for waterproof wristwatch. There was also a broad arrow marking on the dial 
and on the case back to reference the British military. These watches really did lay the groundwork for Omega and served as a platform for the iconic Seamaster collection, uh, which we all know and love today, well, the descendants of today. Now, inside uh, the reference uh, CK2129 was the Caliber 23-4 SC, uh, which was a lovely little manual wind movement, uh, had special adjustment in four positions to within 10 seconds seconds per day so it was incredibly accurate and, and you got to remember this is uh, at the early part of um, the war so this is 1940 really gorgeous watch unfortunately I cannot get one in to review uh, because only I think 2000 were made and obviously because they served on the wrists of pilots there's not that many around and if you were to find one they'd cost an absolute fortune very rare indeed and, and kind of begs the question why hasn't Amiga reissued these incredible watches it's a wonderful part of their history that they haven't really uh, I don't want to use the word exploited but we all know about the Speedmaster going to space and, and the Seamaster and James Bond, but this really is an integral part of not only just horological history, but world history, because had the Allies not won, there wouldn't be no Speedmaster going to the moon. Well, it would probably be a different flag on the moon uh, <laughs> before we get into a whole Iron Sky type scenario. But the point is, the war and World War II no matter who you are, where you live in the world, it shaped the world as we know it today, more than any event in the 20th century. And I do think it would be wonderful for Amiga to, to reissue them or, or bring out something to honor this incredible part of their heritage. But what we do have is one of the descendants of the Flieger watches worn by the access forces well the german luftwaffe in particular now this has been sent in by my good friend jim and this is the friedrich staffen uh, reference 861753 made by laco now laco or laco uh, i do apologize i'm italian so i i will say it laco the italian way but it is i think it's pronounced laco now this particular watch is named after the city friedrich schaffen laco do that to all their watches laco is Quite a historic and important company, founded in 1925 in Pforzheim. Pforzheim uh, is in the state of Baden-Württemberg, and it's nicknamed the Golden City for its watchmaking and jewellery making. Quite renowned, especially in Germany. Uh, for this. So this watch is German made, although it, the movement inside is a Swiss ETA, uh, but we'll get to discuss that in just a moment. Really we should explain a little bit what a Flieger watch is. It is the most classic pilot style watch and it originated specifically in Germany at the start of World War II. Combat aircraft have become such powerful wartime tools that navigators needed, well, watches were deemed absolutely essential and Germany put them into full production. The German government required five manufacturers to build the B style dial, which is what we have today. There is the A dial and there's a B dial. I'll share a picture of the A dial, which was the first, and then the B dial followed later on in the war. Uh, the difference is the a dial has the hours around the outside and the B dial has the minutes. Minutes were more crucial for navigators and then they'd also have the hours in a smaller scale towards the center. B is just a, an abbreviation for Biobactun. I apologize about my <laughs> pronunciation, uh, but basically means observation watch. Now the five companies that were contracted to do so by the German government, well four were German and one was Swiss. So there was a Lange and Zon, the International Watch Company, or IWC, which is Swiss, Leiko, Stova, which we've also reviewed, and of course, Vempe. So the requirements were that the watch had to be anti-magnetic, it had to be chronometer certified, they had to be extremely legible, they always had what's called sterile dials, so there wouldn't be any markings on the, you know, no branding or anything like that on the dial, except for numbers and scales. They had to be robust and typically quite large. I mean, the, the first Fliegers were 55 millimeters and this was designed to be worn over uh, the flight suit. There's a wonderful shot in the Battle of Britain, I think it's the 1969 film, and uh, Michael Caine's in it as well, playing a Spitfire pilot, but he shoots down a Heinkel um, German plane, just as the uh, pilot, I'll, sh I'll see if I can insert a shot, just as the, pilot, the German pilots are bailing out, you can see this massive watch worn on the 
outside of the flight suit. Often the pilots would wear goggles, so it would have to be kind of exaggerated and typical of German over-engineered watches and a stark contrast to the quite quaint and rather elegant Omega that we just looked at. Now initially the uh, movements were converted from pocket watches and manual wind. Numerals would always be in very crisp high contrast Arabic numerals on a black dial. Uh, the central seconds hand, which had to be hackable uh, to allow for adjustments in time, you know, errors, and also for, for basic coordinating precise time. And the large onion diamond shaped crowns were also a must because they had to be able to manipulate the crown wearing gloves. The straps were typically ultra long and double riveted to be worn over the pilot's jackets. And there was always a triangle, sometimes with dots on either side, but usually a triangle at the 12 o'clock uh, to indicate orientation and make sure that you know you, you know exactly which way up the, the watch is. This also had a, a double purpose of being used as a primitive solar compass. So today we have the Laco Friedrich Schaffen. And in my opinion, this is probably the truest representation of the original. Now, I've heard people refer to these as replicas of their World War II ancestors. And it is, I don't really like that word because obviously it has negative connotations with counterfeit watches. But what they're trying to, to get at is that they are very faithful and historically accurate uh, recreations of um, the watches from World War II. So let's get the dimensions out of the way first. We have a diameter of 45 millimeters, a thickness or height of 13. Lug to lug, we're looking at 53, so not really that uh, big there. And lug width is 22 millimeters. Very contemporary, even big by today's standards, but uh, smaller than its ancestors. But this watch does come in various sizes. You can get 36 millimeter version. And if you want to go completely uh, for the genuine, most faithful uh, representation of its ancestors, you can go for the 55 millimeter. Immediately, you'll see that typical B style dial with that very exaggerated minutes and the hour markings, the scale around the dial, the huge plunger hand that are blued. Uh, these are thermally blued, of course, because they are more resistant to fading uh, over time and UV resistant. This is quite an involved process. It requires a lot of skill to heat the steel to a precise level to get that beautiful blue tint to it. The hands, of course, are plunger hands. And look how the hour hand touches the inner scale with the hours and the, the minute hand is massive. Uh, really does reach all the way to the outside of the um, the dial there, as does the second hand. Now the glass is a very slightly domed sapphire glass. It has anti-reflective coating. Beautifully done, sits wonderfully, just a little bit raised from that bezel. The case is entirely sandblasted stainless steel and gives it this very dark, almost rich uh, texture. And of course, this was done deliberately because you don't want the watch reflecting light. The lugs are extremely faithful to the original. Very flat, hardly angled downwards, and they just stick out. Quite reminiscent of lugs you'll see on early wristwatches or trench style watches. We have a snapback case back, and you can just see the little groove there where you put your thumbnail. Uh, it's water resistant 50 meters, I think, and it's engraved just like the originals. And we even have accurate historical markings on the side, just like the originals. The loom is C3 Superluminova, an extremely bright, very well done, lovely, even distribution, very responsive. And I love the way they've loomed specific numerals uh, to assist orientation. Look at it at a glance and you know which way up it is. Ingenious attention to detail that is just so typical of German engineering. We have that diamond shaped onion crown which is very easy to manipulate especially with gloves on. It is of course hackable as you see so we really we should uh, discuss the movement as I'm uh, as I pulled it out. Now 
The originals were manual wind. This comes with an automatic, the LACO 24 movement, which is based on the ETA 2824-2, uh, which is a 25 joule movement, hacking, hand windable, uh, operates at 28,800 vibrations now with the 40 hour power reserve. It's, it's a movement we all know well, featured a million times on the channel. The accuracy is a, as expected. I get about plus seven out of this one. At its price point, I think it's performing admirably. Very robust movements. And in fact, this is something that Leiko did even back in the early days. They were using Swiss movements, buying them in uh, this is before ETA. So uh, you could almost argue that it's faithful historically. The dial itself is a wonderful matte black. Again, not glossy, so to assist legibility. And the markings are in crisp white to contrast perfectly. So the watch comes on this very substantial thick uh, sewn leather strap as you can see marked in German there the rivets just like the originals and kind of cream colored stitching to contrast this very rich almost chocolatey aviator brown and you can hear as I move this about that the, that leather oh it's just gorgeous we have a little engraved signed buckle with a brushed finish one of the few times you actually see the the, the Leiko uh, logo, as I explained before, it doesn't have it on the dial. There's no embellishment, or there's no, it doesn't even say made in Germany. So let's pop it on the wrist and see how it wears. Okay, guys, and here we are. Now I don't have a flight suit, but I do have a military jacket. I just wanted to show you what it would <laughs> look like if you were wear, to wear it uh, correctly. So this is this is how it would have been worn. Um, yeah, anyway, I know, a little bit silly, but uh, I, y you have to kind of appreciate it the, the historically accurate way. But anyway, let's do a proper wrist shot. And there we go. <laughs> yeah, it's almost comedic on my tiny little wrist, uh, the way it overhangs. However, I've got to say, it's quite comfortable. It's not that heavy. We're talking about 114 grams uh, for this particular version. I can't imagine how ridiculous the 55 uh, millimeter <laughs> one would uh, look on me but you know like a clown's watch it's it, very solid very legible exactly uh, does exactly what it's supposed to do um, yeah let's summarize the watch okay so let's talk about the positives first well compared to the other four brands that produced fliegers for the, uh, the german war machine in world war ii Leiko are, without a shadow of doubt, unequivocally, the most truest to those watches. Obviously, we have an upgrade in the materials like the Superluminova, the quality of the production, the finishing, the sapphire glass. Um, everything is, is contemporary, but the design is really unchanged. If you look at IWC, they've gone into making luxury fliegers, something completely different. Um, don't get me wrong, I love them, but very different to, to the watches of World War II. Even Stover, to, to a certain extent, they do embellish their watches. They add a little bit more refinement. Elangen Zone, I, I'm not that I'm aware, but I don't think, you know, they've gone into Hort Horology. From my personal experience and visiting a Lange dealer and trying their watches on, I never saw any. Uh, flight watches there. Vempe have also gone into a different direction. So really it's only Stover and, and Lacko making these historically accurate watches. But out of the two, I, I think the Lacko wins because, uh, well, first of all, they're a little bit more modestly priced. The quality is, as you'd expect, uh, definitely the same as Stover, but it's everything that uh, the, the Fliegers should be. It's robust, it's tough, it's extremely functional. The traditional aesthetic has been recreated with such authenticity. It looks like it came off a pilot's wrist literally, or it was about to go on a pilot's wrist now, right now. Negatives, well, you could almost say the same thing. It's not doing anything new. It doesn't really bring anything new to the table apart from modern materials. Uh, but I think that's the whole point. I really can't um, critique this watch for too many negatives because it's, it's um, so endearing and it's wonderful that the same company is making the same watches, still uh, independent going to this day. Quite astounding. I totally recommend them. And I think if you are an enthusiast of World War II and especially aviation enthusiast, 
you should definitely get one of these in in uh, your collection and i'm not even going to complain about the size because that the size again is 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 true to its roots anyway guys i'm going to leave it there let me know your thoughts queries comments opinions all the rest of it down below thank you very very much for watching please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful and as always i will catch you in the next one okay ciao